So would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, I'm uh, Karen King Bidlack. Okay. So um, I want to ask, so you're here today because you got inducted into the Hall of Fame. How did you get inducted to the Hall of Fame? Well, part of the process for the Hall of Fame is you have to have someone submit an application on your behalf. And unbeknownst to me, uh, my sister, my twin, uh, uh, completed the application. Uh, she filled out all the information, got some background information on me. At that point, that's when I realized what she was doing. Um, and then, what it, uh, from what I understand, um, the Hall of Fame takes the applications and uh, if you don't make it in the first year, they recycle the applications for the next selection, uh, group of selection inductees. Uh, but this year I was selected uh, as part of the group because um, I've done a, a wealth of, of projects and I'm currently uh, a member of the school board, the Fairport Harbor School Board. What kind of projects do you do? Oh my gosh, do we have <laughs> enough time? Um, so I was... One of the projects I do is I'm the president of the Fairport Harbor Civic Club. I'm the first woman president and the group has been in, in, uh, in existence since 1935, so over 85 years. So for the entire years of their existence, they've always had men at the helm. So uh, I became the first woman president uh, a couple years ago. Uh, out of the projects that we work on uh, together, uh, we do the um, Easter egg hunt we do we handle community day uh, we also um, provide a an event called uh, founders day celebration where we honor a citizen of the community or someone who's done a lot to give back to fairford harbor so you don't necessarily have to be a resident and we also honor what we call our, our golden beacon award recipient who is someone who's done a lot for the community but has never been recognized for it so the, we call them the golden beacon and uh, that's some of the projects I do work on. I also uh, am on the Fairport Harbor Mardi Gras. I just re resigned from being the vice president, but I'm still a member. Uh, so I handle some of their like the, uh, some of their projects. I kind of uh, join in with the, the children's events, the senior events, also recognizing veterans uh, for the Mardi Gras during, uh, during their celebration during the 4th of July. Uh, let's see, oh, I'm also president for the Fairport Harbor Tree Commission. Uh, the Tree Commission is uh, uh, residents who are uh, selected by the mayor of Fairport Harbor uh, to uh, focus on uh, recognize, uh, re uh, information about what the trees do, what their importance behind having trees or even planting or the beautification of Fairport Harbor. We also do an Arbor's Day celebration during the month of April. So that's that project. And um, I'm also being on the school board. One of the things I'm very proud of is that we're going to be getting new schools for our school. So I'm excited about that. Uh, they're going to be uh, innovative. Uh, they're going to have high technology. Um, we're going to combine the elementary school with the high school and use the space, uh, the, the, the space, the square footage, uh, a more effective, where we could have large classroom spaces or small classroom spaces, and then we're going to incorporate the library into the structure of the school too. So very excited about that project. I'm actually uh, one of the board members that's on the facility committee. Uh, where I meet with the state of Ohio as well as the current architect, which is TDA. And we, we work through the design process, which we're still working through that. And then we'll be focusing on, uh, the next thing we're doing is working on getting our construction manager, uh, which is going to be the one that's going to control the whole aspect of all the moving parts, material, the labor, the, the uh, contracts. And there's so much more things I do do, uh, but I feel. You know. So were you born in Fairport? And if so, how long have you lived here? You know what? I was uh, born in Fairport Harbor uh, in the late 1950s. But shortly after that, uh, my family moved, moved to another county. Um, and so it wasn't until 
the ha uh, the half part of third grade that uh, my family returned back. I was uh, raised by a single parent, and uh, there's uh, I have four brothers and four sisters, so there's nine of us all together. Um, my four brothers, though, they were away. They did uh, go to the service. So they were in, taking service. They were in the Army and also the Air Force. But then it was myself and my four uh, sisters. Uh, so coming to Fairport, I was finishing out the last part of third grade. And I, I, I mentioned this to some people that Fairport Harbor saved me. And what I mean by that is when I was growing up, as a uh, one of nine children, you don't always get the attention that you think you deserve. Um, you get overlooked. Uh, your wants and needs don't tend to not matter because when your mom or your father are concentrating on your basic needs, everything else gets kind of set aside. So when we came to Fairport Harbor, our eyes just lit up. Across the street from us was a playground. What, what could be greater than that? And we also, uh, my siblings and I found out there's a softball program. I, I fit in. I was joining into groups doing softball. Um, I had someone who gave me an old tennis racket. And so I taught myself how to play tennis. And um, if you know one thing about me, I'm very competitive, almost to a fault. Um, so, one of the things I did was um, I taught myself how to play tennis and I got so good that even the boys didn't want to play against me. Uh, but you know I didn't let up, I didn't ease up on any of them. Uh, you know it's like if you you want to play this is how we're going to play it but I learned the rules of the game. And then even in Fairport in high school I, I was on the, the basketball team and um, I ended up being a most valuable player for basketball. I ended up being most valuable player. I, I was actually part of a tournament team for softball and uh, I took my abilities, I per se, when I graduated and I moved to Chicago. Um, I joined their softball team and their tennis team and I ended up being most valuable player for them. But it's just because I, you know, when you enjoy something, you don't think about it. You don't think about the, how much time you're giving up, or um, the uh, who your, you know, what your talent is, you just enjoy it. All right. So, what year did you graduate high school? I graduated in 1976. Yeah, almost wow. almost 50 years ago. Not quite, but getting there. Uh, and I graduated with a class. I believe it was about 56 56 classmates. Uh, kind of similar to what Fairport has now, but there was a time when Fairport didn't have that. They had like less than 30. Uh, but um, some of the, I, I did, one of the things I enjoyed when I was in high school, even though, you know, graduated in 76, I was part of our cooperative office education program, which is kind of similar to what uh, Fairport has now called PCC but we stayed at the high school and I learned, uh, bus I took business classes and uh, my first job opportunity through the COE was being a, um, working as a dispatcher for the Fairport Harbor Police Department. So how much has the, has the schools changed like since you graduated? Oh, my, well we didn't have a design lab. <laughs> um, uh, there's as a structure of the school is still the same. Um, I love that they honor the, uh, the the past pictures of all the classes that have graduated, but I also like that they now offer uh, the CCP where students, we didn't have that, like I said, we didn't have, you. now you can go to, uh, you can take all classes at Auburn to earn a career. Uh, again, that the only career class that we had was in the school. So everything that we, anything that we expanded beyond our standard classes was like shop or home ec. You don't have home economics now. Home economics is like a life skill where, um, and I, I, I excel very well in that as well. I, I love to cook and I love to sew. But um, 
I don't think you have those classes now, which I think life skills are just as important as career skills. I think it's important to know how to balance your checkbook, uh, how to sew a button on a shirt, uh, how to even fry an egg just so you can feed yourself. Uh, but uh, I think you learn it in other areas. So that's something that's different. Uh, also, when we had lunch, we'd leave the school. We'd have to, well, not in the elementary level, but in the high school, we would we could go home and we'd walk home and we had about, oh, I'd say 40 minutes. Uh, so we had 40 minutes to walk home. So everybody lived within a short distance. Like I said, I was not far from the school, so I was probably 15 minutes away from the school. And if it says 30 minutes, I had 10 minutes to eat. <laughs> so you just did what you did and you, you came back. Uh, what other changes are there? Um, well, back in, in my year graduating, um, I, my classmates actually I went to state, state won a state championship in 1976, and they were uh, they excelled in the track, they excelled in the football, uh, even basketball. I we had wrestling back then. You don't have wrestling now today, so we had wrestling classes and uh, or not wrestling classes but wrestling teams and uh, that, so that's, that's one of the differences too. All right well thank you so much for interviewing this was very wonderful to hear you talk about how things were in the past. And thank you for having me absolutely I appreciate it uh, I'm thrilled and honored to be selected to the Hall of Fame and thank you for interviewing me today. Mm -hmm. Welcome. We are here with Thomas Gillette. What brings you here today? Um, I'm being inducted in, into the High School Hall of Fame, which I was really surprised about. Quite a privilege. What? How did you get inducted into the Hall of Fame? Do you know? I'm not sure. Um, Scott Rebar called me and asked about my background. He wanted to get a little more information. I sent it to him. And um, a couple months later, he told me I'd been selected. I, <laughs> I was kind of shocked. Are there any like interesting facts that you would like to share with us about the Hall of Fame or like Fairport Harbor? Oh, I have a lot of good interesting <laughs> facts, I suppose. I mean, I have a lot of friends who are in the Hall of Fame. Um, Paul Papastache, I've known pretty much um, since high school. Um, his other brother, his sister, uh, my best friend Dave Garden was inducted in the Hall of Fame. Other friends, Skip Luckia. My uncle, Henry Quivola, was inducted. He um, was a chemist, worked on the Manhattan Project, and uh, was a chemistry pr professor his whole life, did research, so, um, yeah, so I know a little bit about it, but I get to experience it firsthand. Is there, is there, like, when you join the Hall of Fame and stuff like that, is there, like, a certain thing you do to like for the process like is there certain positions or anything that you guys do 
Um, when it comes to that? You mean like what I've done, my background? Yeah, and on your background. <clears throat> well, um, I graduated from Wittenberg University in 1974. I wrestled there as a four-year letterman. Um, after that, I went in the Marine Corps, went to officer candidate school, uh, spent three years on active duty as an engineer officer, and um, 20 years in the reserve. In the reserves, I did a lot of things as in uh, the infantry for three years as a platoon commander and executive officer. Um, I was a company commander for an engineer company in the reserves. I was with a motor transportation squadron for a couple years. I was with the wing support squadron, which was a really interesting job. What, what they do is or what we did was basically if you have a, a deployed um, air unit squadron of helicopters or fighters or whatever, the support squadron kind of built the town form. We provided water, electric, um, food, all that kind of stuff, had provided housing, temporary stuff, not permanent, but um, that's basically what we did, and um, had a couple other interesting jobs. I was, um, for one exercise, I was a deputy crisis commander for J3, which is the operations section for the commander-in-chief Atlantic, who is in charge of all the forces in the Atlantic, so it's pretty, unless you knew more about the military, it's probably not going to mean much, but it was a really interesting, and one of the things I found out there, one of my counterparts told me, he said, when you are working and there's um, operations guys, out on the floor, you know, working in intelligence, um, field operations, logistics, aviation, all that kind of stuff. He said, you'll notice if somebody has a problem, the person they go to is a Marine. And one of the reasons why is if somebody's in the Army and they're commissioned, they go to infantry school or they go to engineer school or whatever. In the Marine Corps you go to basic school and we're taught aviation, administration, operations, logistics, infantry. I mean you're taught everything across the board so you have a knowledge of everything and in the service you have as you're promoted in rank, you're, you have to have completed higher level schools like there's the basic school, then they had um, uh, command in no, amphibious warfare school, that's like after high school you might go to college, then they had command and staff, well you went to college, now you're getting your master's degree. And then they have War College, which is like a graduate program. And they even have, when somebody's selected for general, they have a school for generals. It's like two weeks just. So, anyhow, the Marine Corps was fun. I don't know how I got so off topic. You're all good. Um, do you have any heroes from like the Hall of Fame or like back in your past or now that? really you looked up to? Um, yeah. Um, one of them's walking around out there, Paul Kapustashi, and his brother, Dave. Um, they were, uh, they were a few years older than me. I was 
but I always admired them. They were such nice guys. When I was in Little League, um, Dave, Paul, and their other brother, Dennis, used to come down and watch games. And if I was playing, they always talked to me, always offered encouragement. Um, just really, um, for a young kid to have, uh, Paul and Dave were both All-State football players, to have guys like that coming down and encouraging you is really something special. Um, but there are other kids. Uh, my best friend, Dave Garden, um, was a tremendous athlete and a, just an incredible guy. And even though he was younger than I was, I always admired him. He was a big influence in my life. Um, yeah, they're teachers. Um, I had some really good teachers. My favorite teacher, I thought the best teacher I ever had in my life was uh, Ken Babb, who I had for math for five years. and. I don't know, he just, the way he treated his students was unique. He was different than a lot of most teachers. I mean, he, he, he treated us kind of like peers. So, um, I don't know if you... <coughs> Back in uh, 1970, the shooting at Kent State, I don't know if you guys know anything about that, four students were killed. Well, the next day we went into class and went into Mr. Babb's class and he just said, um, well, we're going to skip math today. He said, a lot of you are going to be going to college next year. And, you know, I think it's important that, you know, you have a chance to share your views and just to discuss what happened at Kent State. And I don't know, just, <clears throat> he really had a very positive impact on me. That's good. Well, we thank you for coming in and sitting down and talking to us. Thank you. You're welcome. It's a privilege to be here. I'm glad I got to meet some of you kids. Thank you. Or young adults or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Hello, we are here with Diane Olix and Gary Olix. So why are you guys here today? Oh, we're here to, I guess, meet with some of you students at Fairport High School and uh, attend an assembly that is in conjunction with the uh, induction of our father, Don Olix, into the Hall of Fame. Um, yes, and our, our sister Jody is on her way from Chicago. She'll be here tonight for the football game and tomorrow for, for the banquet. Um, our dad, Don Olix, was uh, literally born in Fairport, somewhere near 2nd and Eagle Street. No one's quite sure where. 
Uh, he was raised here. Uh, he became a good baseball player, which is, most, of all things, probably the one that most likely earned him a spot in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he played a lot of baseball as a kid, and he used to say he could stick his head out the window and holler, and in nothing flat, they'd have enough other kids to have a baseball game. And of course, there were not only other kids for the teams, but there was places to play pickup games, you know, something which is sadly lacking here in Fairport today. Um, right out of high school in his senior year, 1933, here in Fairport, uh, they didn't have a high school team, but he played what was called American Legion ball. And his team was uh, state champions that year. And uh, right out of high school, he got recruited by the St. Louis Cardinals to play in one of their minor league teams, which happened to be Grand Forks, North Dakota, the Grand Forks Chiefs. Now, as luck would have it, or fate, whatever you want to call it, cosmic coincidence perhaps, uh, there was a g high school girl in Grand Forks. She was an avid baseball fan. Some would, some would say, I wouldn't say this, but perhaps she was like a baseball groupie. Uh, she took a liking to the uh, new center fielder, Don Olix, and uh, actually wrote a letter. They picked, she and her girlfriends picked out players from small towns specifically, thinking that they could have a letter get through just addressed to, in this case, Don Olix. Fairport Harbor, no street address, and it worked. And the following spring, returning there to Grand Forks for uh, spring training, they struck up a relationship. Uh, a few years later, got engaged, stay engaged for uh, throughout my dad's uh, playing career, six or seven years or whatever it was in the minor leagues and also managing uh, until he joined the Army to uh, fight during uh, World War II. After, after his stint in the Army and helping to win uh, World War II, uh, Don and Irene were married. Our dad got his uh, chemical engineering degree, returned to Fairport Harbor, went to work for Diamond Alkali, and raised uh, three children. Should I continue? Uh, uh, they returned to Fairport uh, Don stayed active in community affairs. He was always active in the Men's Civic Club, the PTA. He wrote a book on Fairport sports and athletes, which you can still get right here at the library. He, what I remember when I was quite young, he, uh, he, conduct, he organized and conducted what he called a baseball school. It was for grade school age kids which I was at the time and held that probably once a week. A few years later, <clears throat> excuse me, he ran a girls softball program here in town and then he, he organized and managed a boys, what was called E-League team, uh, which was for boys up to 19 years of age and I participated in that myself. Uh, there was no high school program at that time, so for all these years, uh, Don Olix helped sustain baseball in Fairport and keep it keep it moving and along. Softball. And softball, right? Both of those. Um, now, growing up in town here, and I'm sure my sister has the same experience. Everybody seemed to know our dad. When I'd say my name, Gary Olix, they go, "Oh, is your dad Don Olix?" I get this all the time. They seemed to all know him. So I was somewhat of a son of a hometown hero, and it's good to be that, more or less, it's always enjoyable. But I got a real surprise as an adult one time. My mom was going to visit a certain Mr. Greg on Callow Road in Leroy Township to buy hay for her horses. Uh, our mom was a widow by this time, we lost our dad in 1989. But anyway, we went to visit this certain Mr. Greg and uh, while my mom was busy inspecting the hay or some such things, Mr. Gregg took me aside. Now, it turns out that this Mr. Gregg is the son of a certain Mr. Gregg after whom this football field right here is named after, who had been the superintendent in Fairport. And the younger Mr. Gregg, he told me, he said, you know, when I was a teen, your dad was a few years ahead of me in school, and he had begun his 
professional baseball career, and he said, I used to follow him uh, thoroughly. Every day I'd read the next day's newspaper to see how many hits did Don Olix have or what other developments or progress was he making in the game. And that kind of touched me deeply. That was a real surprise, something I wasn't really expecting. So, so I always remember that. So, um, I'd just like to say that, um, remember Fairport's a small town. Whatever you do here is remember thoroughly, whether it's good or bad. So try to, try to be a, a good person. Try to uh, be like the other members of the Hall of Fame. Because whatever you do, good or bad, it'll be remembered and reflect on your family for many generations to come. So uh, be a good guy or girl, be, be, be one to remember in a positive light. Is there any particular reason why you guys joined the Hall of Fame besides that your dad was um, a baseball player? Well, so? um, and how he, the process worked? It was actually our uh, younger, younger sister, Jody, who initiated the idea, but I think uh, Diane and I both feel it's been well deserved for many years. Uh, he was a regular icon in this town as far as sports goes. All the years we were growing up, there were two people, and one was our dad, Don Olix, and the other was Matt Ivory, that seemed to run everything in this town having to do with baseball and softball, and of course Matt ran the swimming programs at the beach, uh, so I, we think this is well deserved. But in addition to the baseball, our father, Don, was actually born here in Fairport. He went to school here. He went away right out of high school to play professional baseball, and afterwards, after fighting in World War II, he returned, got his engineering degree, and came back to Fairport. Really lived out the rest of his life here in Fairport. Was active in community affairs, uh, school board, PTA, men's civic club, and as I mentioned, running all the, the different uh, baseball and softball programs here in town. Do you guys have any like heroes from like the back past or like now then? that you like go off of that helps you? Heroes. Uh, well, I was looking through the the individual Hall of Fame plaques before we came in this area and I recognize a lot of people that I remember from when I was a student here. Uh, people like Matt Ivory and oh, sure. whom I worked for in the summer recreation program for a number of summers while I was in college. And Kenneth Babb, who was uh, my high school mathematics teacher, I think for five of the six years that I had classes here. And he actually became the superintendent, and he was a coach as well. So I was very fortunate to have wonderful teachers and uh, get to know some of the coaches just through living here. It was a wonderful place to grow up. My parents were always active in, like Gary said, PTA, and our dad in the Men's Civic Club helped with a lot of projects. He tried to get some baseball and softball fields built. I can remember going out where they are currently and picking up rocks I do too, yeah. for hours at a time, trying to uh, make a smooth field, and eventually that came to pass. So. Uh, that I just have good memories of the school system and uh, all the people that, that helped to make me very proud to be a Fairport graduate. Yeah, you, you reminded me of something. Uh, um, our dad tried to get a baseball field built when at the time there was still a field at the beach which has since been turned into a, a concert venue and there was a, a field right off of 4th Street where the, it's only football practice fields now but he had tried to get a field built at the corner of East and St. Clair Streets at what's now Cosmic Pet. And just like Diane, I, re I remember actually uh, dragging the infield with uh, like a rake type apparatus trying to get it smoothed out. But I think that project ran out of uh, volunteers and ran out of money, so it never did come to pass. But that's the location right there. Uh, another activity our dad was involved in, he and my mom both, uh, Irene Olexey, they ran the Fairport Carnival, it was called the Harvest Room, every the McKinley School Harvest Room, where they brought in, oh, apples and all the various, um, you know, fruits and vegetables from a fall harvest. And we, we went to 
West Cider Mill in, or I'm sorry, it's West Orchards in uh, Perry, Mr. West, who used to go around Fairport selling apples, he always donated what they call windfall apples, apples that are already on the ground. He donated to the Fairport Carnival. So it was a big thrill to go, they took sixth grade boys, I got to do it one year, go out and pick up the apples and take them to the cider mill in Perry, which I found to be a fascinating process to see all those apples ground up and then pressed to where what's left when they're done, they get all the juice out and all that's done is about as, as dry as cardboard. And actually years later, I built my own little small scale cider press uh, from plans in the Mother Earth News because I think I was still so impressed about about the whole process. So, Oh, you mentioned heroes, okay. And actually I'm so glad to see the heroes on the board here who I remember. I was particularly impressed by the work of the janitors here, both in grade school and in high school. In grade school a fellow went by the name of Aggie Kangas, and he actually was a great basketball coach. He used to conduct uh, coaching sessions after school there at McKinley School, and everyone of my era remembers that going on. And I've talked to other uh, people, uh, actually people in Diane's class, 65, who remember that uh, Aggie would scout the opposing teams and tell tell the players just how to how to take them on, how to, how to best play them. And of course, the other janitor that I remember so well was uh, Yacho Jampa. As soon as Diane and I walked into school today, I said, wow, these floors are shiny. I said, Yach would be so proud of this. Uh, he was quite a character. We remember him pushing that big broom up and down the halls. And he was fond of going down to the beach and working on his uh, tan, which was absolutely world-class tan. By, by any standard. And uh, one other fellow I saw on the Hall of Fame plaques was Chet Rojic. Yes. Very, very well known coach. He coached football here. He coached track here. And I'll tell you, one time I was on the track team, I think I was a sophomore. We were on our way on the bus up to Harvey High in Painesville. And as a complete surprise, he told me I'd be running in the uh, quarter mile which we just call the 440 by another name. Now, I, I was not competitive in track, you know, but I ran this race. Uh, I think one of the Fairport uh, athletes did real good, might have won, and I came in dead last out of maybe six participants. But I remember Coach Rojek met me at the finish line as I was trying to catch my breath, and he said, how'd you do? I said, well, not so great, I came in last. And he said, well, what was your time? And I had learned my time, and I told him, he said, is that your best? And I said, I said, yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, he just said, well, congratulations. And I just always was uh, touched by that as a, as a really great example of uh, coaching and encouragement. That's just the kind of coach he was. So help me out. <laughs> so those those are our heroes. Is there um a big process? Oh, in, I'm okay. You sure? Is there a big process into you guys getting into the Hall of Fame? Like, how long did it take for you guys to get where you guys are at now? Well, this was the first year our younger sister Jody just suggested it. And we th we probably could have been done decades earlier, or from right from the onset. I see no reason why. I think he's very well qualified and deserving of this honor. He's yeah, we just a, he's son of Fairport. And as he, soon as she suggested it to us, we collaborated on writing up some material and giving some background and. Uh, I think we just barely made the deadline. Yeah, we just barely made the deadline, and I was dragging my feet. I said, let's push till next year. And I'm grateful our sister Jody just pushed and, yeah. and, and made it happen for this year. But like I said, growing up here, when it came to baseball and softball in particular, there was two driving forces, and one was our dad, Don Olix, and the other was Matt Ivory, who, ran the, who worked for the schools here and ran, ran the summer programs. 
Well, we appreciate you guys for coming and talking to us a little bit about the Hall of Fame and your father. Um, I think that's about it. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, You're you welcome. Much. recorded here all right we're recording okay sounds good no problem okay so uh why don't you introduce yeah. yourselves yeah you're here with the principal and that's mrs rumbarger oh i thought the principal looked a little old to be a student there oh <laughs> my gosh yeah you're here with the principal <laughs> and three actually they're all sophomores so three sophomores Three and sophomores. Diesel is sitting next to the principal. Sam oh. is in the middle there, and Brendan is all the way on the end there. So they they're okay. looking at you through a little camera. It's a little hard okay. here, so just try to speak up. All right. So uh, apparently, you three won't be able to speak the truth since the principal's sitting next to you. Oh, of course they can. <laughs> Intimidation. Lie. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, all right, students. So, uh, what's your names? My name is Diesel. Sam. My name is Brendan. Okay, good, good. So, you got a football game tonight? No. You do? And uh, are any of you on the football team? No. There, man, I'm trying to do that. What's drum that? Line here, they're in the drum line. Okay. All right. Diesel and Sam are in the drum line. Diesel, you're on the snare, and Sam plays the bass drum. Okay, so oh, all of you go to band too. camp then, huh? Sorry. You guys all go to band camp? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What instruments do you guys play? I play snare drum, and she also plays snare drum. Okay. And what do you play? Uh, I play trumpet. You play trumpet. Okay, yep. cool. All right. All right. So uh who's your favorite drummer? Like go ahead. In the band or like in the whole no, world? No, in the world. In the world. Um I don't, I don't really know. I don't, I don't really have a favorite drummer. No. No. Okay. What do you what about you, little one? <laughs> I'm going with myself. I'm just not. Oh, you go with yourself as your favorite drummer. Okay. All right. I think of that. All right. Okay, so uh, how often do you guys practice? Uh, every day. Every, every day. Every day. Okay. Well, my dad was a musician. He played for Jimmy Dorsey and Tommy Dorsey. He played for Glenn Miller. He was with the Philadelphia Philharmonics and the Indianapolis Symphony. He did all the flute work on the album Shaft. So uh, with Quincy Jones. So he knew all those people. And uh, so what, uh, what subjects are like your favorite subject right now besides music? My favorite, I go to Auburn Career Center and I take um, an IMP class, which is like filming and recording things and making things with computers. I really like that because I can really express myself and 
what I like to do. So that's definitely my favorite thing. Okay, my degree, I graduated after I got out of the Army in 2012. I enrolled in uh, University of Colorado, Denver, and my degree is in uh, theater, film, and TV. So I got a job, uh, a job offer uh, in Hollywood, uh, working for the uh, largest uh, military advisor group on feature films. So I, my knees couldn't take it though, because on a film set, you gotta be there 12, 14 hours on a film set. So my knees couldn't take it. So now I've got a knee surgery done and I'll look farther, look, look a little bit more into it. But uh, I chose theater because I spent, you know, 30 years on stage, 25 years on stage, you know. And, uh, but film and TV, I love making films and, you know, directing and producing. So, uh, and who knows, maybe I'll come back there and teach film and TV, you know. So, uh, what, okay, little one, you're up next. I guess it's, she's Sorry. like, who's she talking to? Yeah, yeah, you look like the smallest one there. Yeah, what's your name? Sam. What? Sam. Sam? Yeah. Okay, Sam. Okay, so other than music, what what do you like out of school? Best best uh, class that you do well that comes easy. What? I'm at Auburn in culinary in the culinary oh. That's my. Oh, favorite. so you wanna wanna be a chef? I don't know, but it's yeah. Yeah, good, good, good. And what are you up to? Uh, so I also go to Auburn Career Center and I am in the electrical engineering prep program. Yep. And yep. I like that class because it allows me to fidget and do a lot of hands-on work. Yeah, I was an electrical contractor for 25 years, 28 years. So that's my career was the three different ones, military, construction, and uh, theater. So as a ballet dancer for 25 years and military and, and it all worked out, you know? So, uh, uh, so now how are you, how, how, are you, how are you guys gonna pay for college? Loans? What? How are you gonna pay for college? I'm not, I'm not really sure yet. I'm not, not I'm sure? Not, my parents aren't paying for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in the same boat. You know, my parents couldn't afford college and I didn't go to college. You know, uh, I went away and then came back and went to Lakeland for a couple of years. And then never, that was back in the 70s. And uh, did a couple of years there short of two years, a, a semester short of two years. And then didn't go back until when I got out of the military. And uh, so it's never too late. If you ever think I'm too old, it's never too late to go back to school. I did it in, uh, at age 60. And uh, when I graduated out of uh, Fairport in 1970, I was just a C student. That was it. And uh, nothing more than that. And when I finished college at a 3.86, so a lot of things in life change and you find out what's important and you apply yourself, you know, to, because other things around you make you aware of what you're doing and what's important. So, uh, and so who's going to win the game tonight? Us. Are you sure? No. I'm positive. I'm not. <laughs> you're not? Okay. All right. No, we're I know some we're of their players. Are they up? Uh, is Wycliffe pretty good this year? Um, they're not great, right. but they're just a bigger school than us. So oh, just... they're always a bigger school. You know, everybody's a bigger school. Do they have a, a, a record the same as Fairport? They're one and two, and we're one and two. And I'll give you another stat, Mr. Oh, uh, shoot. They're one and two. So, Oh, good. 
You guys will win. And we had a win the first week of the year. We played Akron North. We beat them 25 to 0. Oh, they good. played at Wycliffe played Akron North and they lost uh eight to seven. So Man, that's an odd score. It is. It was like there was like a Wow. safety or something against yeah. Whitcliffe and uh, Akron North got the win at the very end in the fourth quarter. So wow, that's an odd score. But so, I, I mean, I'm looking at that. I'd put my money on Fairport easily. Yeah, easily. I put my money on Fairport. Darn right. So yeah, no, I'm, I like that. I like those odds. And you know, the players, they like the odds too. They're going to go in there with the idea that Wycliffe's beatable and they got beat by a team that you guys beat. So, yeah, I, I'd go with that. I'll go with that. So, uh, so tell me about this music. Do you do other things outside of school with music? Um, I mean, recently, I've been um, learning the keyboard a little bit. Yeah. So I do that. Um, I practice drums outside of school. Yeah. And, um. Sometimes I mess around with my little brother. I'll make songs with them. He's in tight. So, huh? God bless you. Okay. So you you do some stuff with the piano, huh? Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, my dad, when I asked him, you know, he played saxophone, clarinet, and flute. And I said, uh, well, how, how can you play three of them? And he said, the fingering's the same on saxophone, clarinet, and flute. So, but I said, if you had another instrument to learn instead of, uh, you know, wind instrument, he, he chose piano. He would rather have done piano. So, you know, and everything's written for piano. You know, that's, uh, uh, everything's like that. So what else do you do, Sam? I'm really good one. Do you do anything more with music other than school? Not really. Not really? Get in a band. You'll learn a lot more in school uh, with uh, music once you have to learn it and be in a band. Once you're under pressure to do that, you'll learn a lot more, a lot faster. Yeah. And drum, every, every band needs a drum, drummer. So, Okay, so uh, next up, what I forgot, what's your name, sir? Brendan. Brendan, okay, Brendan. So uh, uh, what do you do after, uh, do you do anything with music? Um, I also occasionally play a little bit of guitar. I'm not very good at, at it, and, some, and a little bit of drums. Oh, good. Oh, cool, cool. So do all three of you live in Fairport then? I do, I don't know. I don't think I, I don't. I live in Concord. Oh, you live in Concord. Huh? And Sam. Where do you live? What? You're in Fairport. You're you're leaning back, which means your voice is leaning back from the microphone. Okay. So where do you do you live in Fairport? Not anymore. What? Not anymore? Okay. And, and, and Brendan, you, are you in Fairport? Uh, yes, I do still live in Fairport. Oh, good. Are there a lot of students that don't live in Fairport? Yeah. Yeah, about 38%. How do they get to school? They get dropped off by mom and dad? They drive themselves? Yeah. 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 Wow. See, now, when I went to school, there was nobody. Everybody was from Fairport. I don't remember anybody living outside of Fairport when uh, when I was in school for years, you know. So, how do you guys feel about the new high school coming up? Because you're going to be in it. I do. Yeah. I just want air conditioning. <laughs> so, so you're going to have uh, you're looking forward to a new building? Yeah. Uh oh. Time's up. Look at, oh, but man, that class is unloading. Wow. Mr. Clark, we're going to have to take you up to the auditorium. We're going to have to have you re-log in up there. Okay. So we're going to log out and log back in for the big assembly. Sounds good. So we're going to move on up. 
All right. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. All right, you guys, you, you guys have a good Welcome to the Harding High School School Hall of Fame Assembly. The people sitting on this stage and on the Zoom have sat in these same seats at one point in their life. They've played on the same fields and courts and sat in the same classrooms. They also graduated from Harding just like you will someday. They are here today because they are being inducted into the Fairport Harding Hall of Fame tomorrow night. They are here today to share their experiences here at Harding, as well as where their Harding education took them throughout their lives. We're going to start with a Zoom with Mr. James Clark. Welcome, James. Okay. Okay, so I don't have a video. All right. The webcam isn't working. His webcam's not working. I'm going to grab a different one in a sec, but we can see you and, and hear you. Okay. All right, sounds good. I want to see all the students. Yep. I know. I'll be right back. All right, buddy. Okay. Okay, so I graduated in uh, 1970, along with my buddy there, Tom. I miss my buddy. I miss Tom. And I'm upset that I didn't get back and, and see everybody, be there with the students, and uh, get to sit and talk with Tom. You know, I, I, I miss that. I miss that guy all those years. And uh, so after uh, after high school. You know, I wasn't ready for college. Come on, I'm, uh, I'm getting out of high school like, with a C average. And so I go join the Army and go over to Vietnam for 14 months, flying as a helicopter crew chief door gunner. And uh, once I got out, then I went back to, or came back home and went to Lakeland. You know, I was married, got married, and went back to Lake, Lakeland College for almost two years, didn't get the degree. And then uh, moved back to uh, Colorado because I was stationed in Colorado after Vietnam. So then uh, over the years, uh, I missed the military and I had become an uh, uh, electrician. So I was working as an electrician and then I uh, ended up in 1988 joining the uh, Colorado National Guard. So over the years, now I got you. I got everybody there. I see everyone. So now then uh, uh, I joined the uh, Colorado National Guard and uh, so I'm flying, I go to flight school and I'm flying helicopters for the Colorado National Guard. Then they get rid of that helicopter that I was flying. I'm too old to go back to flight school so I go back to being a crew chief on the helicopters. Uh, we get deployed a few times. We go down to South America uh, with the helicopters, and uh, then Iraq starts up, and uh, we get Black Hawk helicopters, and we're a medevac unit. So we go over to Iraq and, uh, to pick up the wounded to fly medevac. We pick up the wounded from the battlefield. So I spent two years straight over in Iraq flying as a crew chief picking up the wounded, uh, while everything's going on too. I mean, the bad guys are still around, they're still shooting at us, but that's our job as a, as a crew chief, medic, and, and uh, to go get them. So I spent two years straight over there, 101st comes back to replace us after the first year, and they said, oh my God, you got a Vietnam back here. Yeah, well, we need a mask on. Okay, so I'm just joining stay with the 101st Airborne. So I stay with them and uh, run their maintenance and, and uh, run their crew chief flight, flight schedules and go fly anyway with all of the uh, uh, all of the missions. And I finally finished up my third tour in 2011. I was uh, 59 years old uh, when I finished my last tour 
over in uh, Iraq, you know, flying and, and, and providing, uh, you know, security for the helicopter whenever we picked up the bad guys. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was the best job I ever had, you know, just the best. And then uh, uh, I, I get out in 2000, I get out in 2012 and I decide I'm going to go back to college. So I go to the University of Colorado Denver full time with all the students there, you know, no online classes. So I, I finish up uh, four years and uh, graduate with a degree in theater, film, and television. Uh, from the University of Colorado Denver. Now, about the second year I'm in school, my little sweetheart from high school shows up. And she's, uh, she was my high school sweetheart when I was 17 and she was 15. And throughout the years, she went and did her thing with kids and marriage, I did my thing. And uh, she's a nurse practitioner and she just got her doctorate last year or this year, I mean, well, let's see, no, it's last year, she got her doctor, and so she comes out to Rifle, Colorado, as a nurse practitioner, because she loves fly fishing, so now she uh, gets a hold of me, and uh, we start talking, and, and then uh, she realizes how expensive homes are, so she moves down to Denver, 15 minutes from me. So then we get back together in, in 2018. I married my high school sweetheart. So, uh, uh, so now where I'm at, I'm retired military, uh, disabled vet, and uh, so I get my knee worked on because I, I got an offer in Hollywood to work on films, uh, on feature films with an outfit that provides military advisors on feature films. And uh, so my wife, uh, we get married in 2018, and uh, that's uh, where my life is right now. Uh, life is good, uh, and uh, I always think about Fairport though. So quite frankly, we're, you know, my wife has got a grand, a grand uh, two-year-old this October grandson, and I know what kind of joy it brings her life. And so we're kind of looking at uh, moving back to uh, Ohio, Northeast Ohio, uh, somewhere around in there, or going to Atlanta, Georgia, because that's where all the big film studios are for me to get back into work. So we're kind of debating on whether to have the big house and outside of Atlanta, not in Atlanta, but outside of Atlanta, and a smaller home in Fairport, or the big home, not in Fairport, but Northeast Ohio, or the big home in Northeast Ohio, and the smaller place in Georgia. So we haven't quite decided yet. So that's, uh, you know, that's what I do now. I just, uh, I love making films. Uh, the degree is theater, film, and TV, because I spent 25 years on stage acting uh, musicals, plays, and was a principal ballet dancer for 25 years. I studied in New York City with American Ballet Theater, New York City Ballet, and uh, danced uh, as a guest artist for Colorado Ballet, and Pueblo Ballet, and uh, Fort Collins, Canyon Concert Ballet, so I had a great career with that. I was an electrical contractor, and I wired anything from schools as big as the new one uh, down to homes. So I had a varied career. Uh, but the best one, best job I ever had was going out there and uh, picking up the wounded. And that's why I had to stay over there when they asked me to stay an extra year in combat zone. That's why I stayed. Because uh, I was picking up soldiers not much older than you. And uh, it's, it's just that rewarding. Uh, yeah, I got injured a little bit over there. I got too close to an incoming mortar round about 25 feet away. Moved my eyeball in my head. And uh, I've had about a dozen surgeries between both eyes to try and fix it. And uh, so, but still, I do it all over again. 
and uh, it's uh, the military for me was uh, very very rewarding. It also paid for my school. So uh, any of you kids want free school? There's your path right there. <laughs> and uh, so that's about my life right now. I, I uh, just uh, spent my time in construction, so I do a lot of stuff around the house. Yeah, uh, but I, I, I'm looking at this uh, auditorium. That auditorium has been around for so long that I can see where I was sitting. You know, I just, I love the school and, and uh, you know, throughout all the years, no matter where I've been or whatever, I, you know, you just have, I just have the, uh, that inner draw that you can't get rid of ever on where you grew up and, and what school you attended and uh, all of the things that are about the school. And uh, I can remember all the hallways, everything that I was doing. Yeah, I spent three years in sports there, in wrestling and in football. Not very good at either one of them, but that's not what, what my calling was. My calling was something else. And uh, you don't really realize your calling until you're out of school sometimes. And you have some uh, life years underneath you. And uh, to decide, what's really important to you and what's important to others. And the most important thing was I knew how to do my job in the military and, and uh, those wounded soldiers deserved someone there on the worst day of their life to uh, take care of them. And uh, I'll tell you one story. We picked up this soldier, very tall, very tall soldier, and in the black rock, and the litter, his, his head was hanging over the edge. Uh, now, I'm a hard case, and they used to call me Ice Cube Park because uh, there wasn't anything I wouldn't, there was no mission dangerous enough for me not to go on. And uh, so we pick up this soldier, he's not wounded that bad in the leg. But it's, he's tall, and his head is hanging over the edge of the uh, 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 of the litter. So I can see he's only about 19, and he's got a wedding ring on. So I know he's just probably recently married. And uh, I've been on a lot of missions, some very very bad ones, where the soldiers were very bad at wedding. And and I know that this this soldier, he's, uh, he's not that bad, so he's going to be just fine. But I didn't know how scared he was, you know. So I reach over and get an army blanket, and it's the, it, when they load him on the helicopter patients, the head is at one side of the helicopter and the feet are at the other side. So usually they load in, you know, uh, the head side towards me, so I can do CPR. And I've done CPR too many times on soldiers. But I get this army blanket, I put it underneath his head, and, uh, and I reach over, he reaches over, uh, I mean, because he put it under his head, and now he didn't have to support his head with his arms. So I'm back out looking at the helicopter, and the next thing I know, his hand reaches over and he's holding my hand. And even though I had been through a lot of other crap with that, that one gesture I couldn't even uh, I couldn't I couldn't keep it. I couldn't keep it straight. I had to put my dark visor down so uh, to hide my tears. So that was the best job I ever had. Just that little gesture. He was scared, so I put and grabbed my hand for to be secure. That's what I was there for. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you so much, James. Give James a big round of applause.
second inductee today is Mrs. Karen Midlap from the Harding class of 1976. Karen graduated from Harding as an athlete and a future community leader. Please welcome Fairport Board of Education member Karen Midlap. Uh, first, I'd like to I want to thank everyone for being here today to celebrate the newest inductees. I'm proud to be grouped with some wonderful individuals who have contributed so much and have done so much. Congratulations to Jay Clark, class of 70, 70 uh, Don Holix, class of 33, and Tom Gillette, class of 1970. Very proud to be with you today. I'm honored to be here today, and I'm blessed to have so many people in my life who have encouraged me. Special thanks to the Fairport Harding Hall of Fame for this special honor, and thank you, Dr. Paolo, Principal Rump Harbor, and the school board, and for the student body. I met some wonderful children, their students today, uh, during the, the, the design lab, so thank you for all your questions, and I hope I provided some insight to you. I know a lot of work goes into putting the wonderful event in place, and I understand the planning behind the scenes. Therefore, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Now that you've heard some of my, a little bit of my life story and a few of my accomplishments, I thought I would tell you what inspires me to do the things I do. I came to Fairport Harbor in third grade. I am one of nine children, and my mother brought us to live in Fairport Harbor to help care for our grandmother. Although my brothers were away in service, me and my four sisters, with the oldest being 13, lived in a single parent environment. While my mom was away at work, myself and my sisters would take turns cleaning the house and caring for each other. We had daily chores, but nothing that an eight-year-old could handle. I tell people that Fairport Harbor saved me. I always felt like, I just was one of the crowd. Nobody important. Once I came to Fairport Harbor, I started making friends. The village was full of kids like me who just wanted to be noticed. We didn't spend a lot of time watching TV, and our only resource of social media was yelling over to the neighbor. We walked everywhere, saw the beautiful Fairport Harbor sites, the beach, park, churches, and that half-block visit to Mackey's store to buy Penny Candy, now known as Vasquez. Making friends came easy, so I made more friends. Friends of different walks of life. Poor, well-off, some with different backgrounds, boys and girls. They all became my friend. I loved school and joining sports teams. In Fairport Harbor, everyone was part of the team. How great is that? When I started playing softball at the age of eight, I learned I was a lefty. I didn't think much of that at first and learned not many pitchers knew how to throw to a lefty. lefty. Needless to say, I brought in a lot of friends for my team. I learned at a young age, I always had a need to help others. My mother, neighbors, helping at the convent, which is where the nuns lived, and collecting food for hungry families. I didn't always know how or even why, but I knew something should be done or had to be done. First, I have learned to do it for the right reason and never expect anything in return. Helping others came natural for me. When I was 10 or 11, I taught my sister, who was six, how to ride her first bike. I wrote my first book in fifth grade I volunteered in fifth grade to help first and second graders how to read. I joined the church youth choir in sixth grade. I remember one day my mom was in a rush to get to work. And I didn't have time, and she didn't have time to cook breakfast for me and my siblings. She immediately instructed me to cook breakfast. Oh my, cook breakfast? I was a little surprised, but I wanted to help my mom. I was nine years old. That was the beginning of my love for cooking. I put some thought into what I might say today and wanted to share with you the four pillars of the National Honor Society. Scholarship, character, leadership, and citizenship. 
For 10 years, I was a National Honor Society advisor here at Fairport. Whenever a student was required to write an essay, I always told them to start with a quote from a well-known person. The quote I chose, and hopefully you can relate to it in your own life, is from Helen Adams Keller. She was an American author, disability rights advocate, political activist, and lecturer. She was born in Alabama and lost her sight and her hearing due to illness at the age of 19 months. She was the first deaf-blind person to earn a bachelor's of arts degree and went on to write books and speak at engagements. Her quote, I am only one, but still, I am one. I cannot do everything, but still, I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the one thing I can do. This quote is inspiring and has had so many meanings. Helen could have dwelled on her disabilities and let others care for her. She could have easily chose to do nothing and allow her disabilities to control her life. Instead, she traveled to 35 countries advocating for those with vision loss. Not only did she campaign for women's rights, she campaigned for world peace. Sometimes our own disabilities get in the way. They may not be physical disabilities, but possibly an inner fear that limits your confidence, such as taking them. It could be more of an obstruction in your life and prevent you from being happy. Maybe you have difficulty with some of your courses, English, science, or just not good at making friends. That's okay. I promise you, you will get better. And if you make that, as long as you make that first step. So the four pillars of National Society starts with scholarship. Scholarship is about education and gaining knowledge and allowing the knowledge to guide you. Anything I did and do has to have a purpose, a goal, and an end result. I was an average student, getting A's and B's, and some classes, D's. I loved English, journalism, business, and drama. The classes I did like were math and science. No offense to our current teachers. One of my teachers was Mrs. Klinger. She was my English teacher. And one class project included reading a book and then standing up in class to talk about it. Although I liked to read, I wasn't much for public speaking. You see, I had a stuttering problem. I overcame my stuttering with the aid of the teacher in eighth grade. Now that I was in high school, the last thing I wanted to do was speak publicly for fear I would stutter again. Mrs. Klingerman had a way to laugh with you and not at you. Like my eighth grade teacher, she was able to calm me. They, helped, they both helped me to gain my confidence. Next, I want to mention Mr. Dunlop. He was my business teacher for typing. You now call it keyboarding. Uh, he taught me in business management, business accounting, and he gave me time, or he gave me per special permission to be the, the first sophomore to take shorthand. Shorthand was a form of writing, sort of like Egyptian writing, lettering, that was used by office secretaries. A sophomore taking the class was unheard of and not well accepted by the juniors and the seniors who were permitted to take the class. I completed the class with a B and I felt proud to prove I could do it. Math was a completely different story. This was a class I got at Dean. I did well with measurements, graphs, lines, measurements that way. But when it came to x plus y equals z, this girl was never going to get to understand. I gave up. I literally gave up. Took that one class and I was done. But for the rest of my life, into childhood, into adulthood, I always had a sick feeling in my stomach any time the word math was mentioned. But it's important to know. At the age of 53, I went back to college. In order to graduate, I had to take a math class. Yep, that sick feeling started, and all my fears of math came back. But if I wanted that degree, I had to face my worst fear and go for it. It was at that time I learned that you, what you do on the left side must equal the right side. 
After all these years, they collect. At the age of 55, I finally graduated with an associate's degree from Lakeland Community College. The next pillar for NHS is character. Character is about treating others as you would like to be treated. Being ethical and inspiring others to make good choices. Surround yourself with people in your life that encourage you, because that is what I did. They will help keep you focused and grounded. Choose to stand for, what, for others so that they don't have to stand alone. Too many times we are in a hurry and live in a drive-through society. We don't always take the time to listen to someone and hear their trials and tribulations because our life carries more importance. People don't normally want to tell you they are hurting. It's not cool and it makes them feel less important. Gain their confidence and importantly, gain their trust and be their friend. Leadership. Sometimes you can't lead unless you have some idea of what direction you are going. You may not think you are the right, the right person to lead, but everyone can be a leader. Watch and learn from others. Watch how they lead and how they handle difficult situations. It's very simple. In high school, you study for a test. If you study well, you can get a good grade. If you study hard, you can get an even better grade. Sometimes as a leader, you may come up with a good idea. Try it out for size. But remember, some good ideas are just that, good ideas. It doesn't mean you failed, it just means you had a few obstacles. It might be a good idea to change your path and go in a different direction. Start small and then build on that. The last NHS pillar is citizenship. Citizenship is about the good things you do for mankind, your family, including your community. It's about knowing your audience. To some, that could mean your classmates. It could mean your family. It could mean your teachers. Find help in others. Reach out to that classmate who normally wouldn't talk to you. Someone always have, has a different view and may surprise you. You are never going to know all the answers and undoubtedly will make mistakes. Don't be embarrassed when you make a mistake. Sometimes it's better to know the mistake made early to avoid putting all that time going down the wrong path. I'm not alone when I say it does take a village. We are all different in our own ways. We come from different backgrounds, education, but together we can accomplish so much. So when I called Fair, when I called Fair for Harbor my home at the age of eight, I never knew I would grow to love this community so much and the people who live here. I never knew I would dedicate my life to the betterment of Fair for the community, school, and my church. I learned so much about myself, my strengths, and my weaknesses, and my talents. I am forever grateful and so proud to serve you and the community as a school board member, and now a Hall of Fame inductee. Thank you. Our next inductee today is Don Olich from the class of 1933. Don was born and raised in Fairport and went on to play professional baseball. Don worked at the Diamond Shamrock Plan here in Fairport. Here to speak about Don today is his son, Gary. Welcome. Now, I got to know Wilbur 
when he taught eighth grade Ohio history. Did you? No, it's my answer. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? I, I got to know Wilbur in eighth grade Ohio history, which he taught, and it was one of the leaders on our eighth grade Ohio history trip. I got to know Wilbur quite a bit better, however, when this one particular teacher, who I believe had it in for me, marched me over to uh, Wilbur's office, the principal's office, where Wilbur was kind enough to introduced me to the Board of Education. Now this, this particular board, my friend Bob knows, this is not a group of people who run the school, it was literally a board that Wilbur had run, uh, hanging on his uh, wall. Uh, back to the, the subject of my dad. Uh, my dad, Don Alex, was born, literally born in Fairport, somewhere in the vicinity of 2nd and Eagle Street. No one is sure where. And it was raised here. He became a good baseball player because, in part, there were so many kids his age, and he would say that he could just hang his head out the window and yell, and in no time flat, they'd have enough uh, kids his age for a baseball game. And there was plenty of places to play baseball fields uh, in those days, something which is, in my opinion, sadly lacking today. Uh, Don Owens graduated in 33. There was no high school team here then. But he played what was called American Legion Ball, which was very popular back then. His team that year was uh, state champions for Ohio. And scouts somewhere had noticed him. He was recruited right straight out of high school to play for the St. Louis Cardinals at their minor league uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota team, the Grand Forks Chiefs. Now, it just so happened by a cosmic coincidence there was a high school girl in Grand Forks named Irene Anderson, who was an avid baseball fan. Some might even say, I would never say this, but some might say she was a baseball groupie. So she and her girlfriends, they followed the team, ended up uh, picking out, each would pick out a player from a small town, hoping that they could get a letter through just addressed, in this case, Don Olick's Fairport Harbor, Ohio, and it did work. And the following year, when my dad, Don, returned to Grand Forks for spring training, which was sometimes accompanied by snow in North Dakota, well, anyway, he and Irene struck up a relationship, and after a while, they became engaged. Now, Don continued to play baseball in the minor leagues for six or seven years and managed the team there in the minor leagues until he enlisted in the Army to fight in World War II. Uh, upon the conclusion of the war, Don and Irene were married. Don attained his uh, chemical engineering degree. They returned to Fairport Harbor where he went to work for Don and Alkali. And uh, Don and Irene raised three children in Fairport who lived here the rest of their lives. Don remained active in uh, the community, in the Penn Civic Club, school board, uh, PTA Carnival, McKinley School. He wrote a book on sports and athletes in Fairport. It's still available in the library. I encourage you to check it out. It covers a lot of different sports, including cross-country skiing and some you might not be as, as well familiar with. Uh, Don also played a lot of tennis here over at the courts that used to be here. Not another sad loss we no longer have. Uh, my sister Diane and I would play a lot of tennis over there with uh, our mom and dad. Uh, he actually coached a young fellow named Doug Lintola, who ended up becoming a tennis pro sometime that, thereafter. I myself was always frustrated by tennis. Uh, Diane just reminded me we used to hit the ball against the, the gym wall there, but I was frustrated because I realized no matter how I tried, I would never be as good as that wall. So it frustrated me. Don helped to sustain baseball here in Fairport in those years. He started a baseball school to teach grade school boys and girls. He started and ran a girls softball program. He started and ran uh, what was called a class E league for boys up to 19 years old. I participated in that as did uh, Paul Cops, that's you over here. 
So, like I said, during those lean years when there was no high school team, he helped sustain Fairport. When I was growing up, there were two names that were just fundamental to baseball and softball in Fairport, and those were Don Olix and Matt Ivory, who worked for the schools and ran the summer program. Now, everyone seemed to know my dad when I was a kid growing up here. I was more or less the son of a hometown hero, and it's good to be the son of a hometown hero. But I had a real surprise when I was an adult, and after we had lost uh, my dad, which was in 1989. But I went with my mother. She was buying hay for the horses that she kept from a Mr. Gray on uh, the Cicalo Road in Leroy Township. Now, when my mom was inspecting or loading the hay or working out the details, Mr. Gray took me aside. You see, he's he was the son of the former superintendent, Mr. Gregg, after whom the football field was named. And Mr. Gregg, the younger Mr. Gregg, told me, he said that when he was a teenager, my dad was a few years older than him. My dad had started playing professional baseball. Mr. Gregg would follow his career by looking in the next day's newspaper every day to see how many hits Don Olix had had, what other activities he'd been up to in his baseball career. So that was a real surprise and kind of an inspiration to me at that time. You might want to keep that in mind and remember, Fairport's a very small town. So no matter what you do, you're going to be remembered well here by the people here and uh, future generations. So I encourage you, do well. Uh, be like the members of the Hall of Fame, whatever is your passion or your pursuit. Uh, don't be someone like Richard Dahmer who collects cooks and eats hitchhikers. Be rather someone who cures cancer or some other notable activity because you will be remembered for a long, long time whether you do something uh, very admirable or something notorious. And it will reflect on your family for countless generations to come. So uh, be the best you can out there. Thank you very much.
I was four years old. I had no idea where in town I was or how to get home. I think I was probably crying. And the house I was standing in front of, the owner came out. He asked me, are you all right? And I said, my brother and, and my friend, we were riding bikes and they left me and I don't know how to get home. So he ended up, I told him who I was, he happened to know my grandfather. We put the bike in the car and drove me home. The reason I tell those two stories is the Clary family, from meeting Tommy when I was two years old, has been a, a friend. Their family has been a friend of our family for, for many, many years. And also, to show that um, how helpful fair work is. The support you get from out of the blue people you don't expect. So anyhow, um, I really, really enjoy growing up in Fairport. I come back at least once a year. Um, the school here was really good. And one of the things uh, that I remember most were the opportunities we had. Um, when I was in fifth grade, um, you could start playing an instrument. I had no desire to do that, but my mother told me I was going to play an instrument, so I started playing an instrument. And by the time I got to high school, um, I started to play fairly well. And in eighth grade, I was in the senior band. Um, and I really learned to enjoy playing in the band. We had a pretty ex exceptional band director at that time. Um, we competed in uh, state district and state band contests. And for four to five years I was in the band, we got a superior rating in the state. So, um, also, I played football, wasn't very good, but um, was on the varsity the junior and senior year, played freshman basketball, and ran track a couple years, and um, when I was a sophomore after football season, the football coach said, told me wrestling starts in a week. And I said, oh, I'm going to play basketball. And he said, wrestling starts in a week. And I said, well, and he said, wrestling starts in a week. So I became a wrestler. Um, another thing I hadn't considered, but I fell in love with the sport immediately. I lettered my three years here at Fairport and lettered four years in college. Um, other opportunities, we had a junior and senior class play. I didn't think I had any acting ability or anything, but in a school like Fairport, if you don't participate, things don't happen. So I tried out for the plays and found I really enjoyed it. I never pursued acting after that, but it was a really good experience. And I learned a lot. We had um, people in the stage crew and whatever were really a big part of what we were able to do. It wasn't just the people on the stage, it was a, a group team effort. Um, after, after high school, I went on to college at Wentworth University, and before I get there, between junior and senior year, I was Fairport's representative of the Buckeye Boys State. 
I don't know if they still do that, but anyhow, basically what they do, they got a group of kids. We went to Ohio University, and you put together state and local governments. Well, when I got there, I didn't really know what was going on, and, and uh, once we got going, the first thing we're doing is electing state officials. And there are these two guys from the area. My guy was his campaign manager, and he got up there, beautiful speech, knew what he was talking about, and then the guy he was supporting for governor got up to speak. He had a, a platform already prepared as to what he was going to do at governor. He ended up winning, and when I got to Lindbergh, they were both there, and I'm thinking, you know, that was kind of intimidating. I saw how professional they were, how prepared they were, and I'm thinking, well, how am I going to do with competing with people like that? And then there are kids from other schools, larger schools, and you're hearing during freshman orientation, kids saying, well, I placed out of English, I placed out of this course or that course. So I'm thinking, you know, this is going to be a lot of work. But as it turns out, um, I did quite well. The guy who was governor ended up being my roommate for three years. Uh, we still maintain contact, and his campaign manager is another close friend of mine. So, I mean, there's, uh, you don't need to be intimidated because you come from a small town like Fairport. Um, I was a little bit, but I didn't need to be. Uh, one of the other things I did, um, I started taking speech classes in college. I, it was just one of those things that, oh, I don't want to have to get up in front, in front of people and talk. You know, I just got too nervous and, and whatever. So I took the speech classes hoping I would be able to learn to do it, but never expecting I would have to do it in real life. So anyhow, I was doing a, a speech on, on selling Reese's Cups, and I had a, a drawing with a sectional drawing of the Reese's Cup, so you could see the peanut butter inside and the chocolate on the outside. And I knew if I just held it up, my hands would be shaking. So I just put my hands on the podium and held it that way, so people can tell I was that nervous. Um, it's one of the things that we need to do in life is recognize some of our weaknesses and figure out how to get better at it. After I graduated from college, I went into the Marine Corps. I went to Officer Academy School. Um, something I had been wanting to do for a few years and finally had the opportunity. Again, once I got there, I was pretty scared. I mean, the Marine Corps is, is uh, pretty, pretty tough. Not an easy to get through um, boot camp or in my case, Officer Candidate School. We started out with 62 in my platoon and by the time I was commissioned, we had lost 32 candidates who dropped out or were kicked out, and we only commissioned 30. Um, and I spent three years on active duty in the Marine Corps and stayed in the reserves for 20 years, retired as a lieutenant colonel. Unlike Jay, I never had the, uh, never served in combat. During the Desert Storm in 1991, I was scheduled to be called up, but the 
water ended the day before I was scheduled to go. So, um, some could say I was fortunate. I kind of missed that feel I missed out. And in my civilian life, I worked as a facilities director. Started at University of Pennsylvania, then went to a smaller school district and ended up my last 15 years at Pennsbury School District, a uh, pretty large school district. We had 11 elementary schools, three middle schools, two high schools, an administration building, a maintenance facility, a uh, field house, and a couple of, of a warehouse and a separate garage. So I had 200 people working with me in my department. Uh, we graduated um, somewhere between 900 and up to over 1,000 students every year. When I, a lot of the things I learned in Fairport from my mom, from my friends and family, from teachers here in college, and the Marine Corps is pretty basic about leadership, how to be a, a good leader. The Marine Corps put a tremendous amount of influence on, into that. And what I found, for me personally, um, you develop your own style of leadership, and I never could think of myself as a boss. If somebody called me boss, I was not happy. I always felt I was a co-worker, and I wasn't any more important than anybody else. I just had a different job than they did. And uh, it worked pretty well. I, I uh, had a pretty good career there at Pensbury. Um, over the 15 years I was there, we renovated three or eight elementary schools and high school, and um, I was in charge of about $350 million for those renovations. So, it's pretty pretty good experience. Um, so, I think. What I recommend for, for you students is take opportunities. If there's something that you can do, try it. You might not like it, but it doesn't hurt to try. I mean, if I skip things that I didn't feel I would like, I would have missed a lot. Um, so don't be afraid to, to try things. And my mother always said, if you're going to do something, you do it right. You don't do a mediocre job. That was really stressed in the Marine Corps. Um, if you um, were temporary duty somewhere and staying in the barracks, you didn't leave the barracks like you found them. You left them better than they were when you got there. And one of the other things I learned in the Marine Corps was after you finish an operation, a project, whatever, you don't say, okay, I'm done with that, I'm on to the next thing. You stop and you reflect on what you did. We used to have a, do an after action report um, to put down in writing what worked and what didn't work. And I found that extremely useful throughout my career. Um, it helped me to recognize things that were a problem that I didn't really know were a problem and found some things that were really successful that I didn't expect to be that good. So just accept the challenge, do the best you can, and try and continue to improve. Thanks a lot.
back to our school community. Let's give them a big skipper applause.